All right, trip with monads and some longer part of this title I don't remember. Uh, actually, my friend made me to make, to make this title like that. I don't really recall why. Anyway, I did this presentation internally to my colleagues in April, and then I thought to myself, I can do better than this. So I started redoing this from the scratch last week, and then I realized, ah, I'm not gonna make it, and then I realized I deleted the other presentation as well. So, uh, for the past 48 hours, I was trying to combine everything into one thing, into one slide. Eventually, I had everything. It's just that the code itself doesn't have colors. Um, so, there's gonna be a lot of code. So, I apologize for that. I know it's, it's weird to look at colors without you know, our, our beautiful syntax highlighting, but this is the reality. All right, so, I guess John a little bit maybe convinced you why functional programming is so great. Why it is so great? Well, because you get modularity. Uh, if you have functions which only return values, then it's really, really easy to write a software which is modular. It's also testable. Because if you ever think about tests that you ever write in, when you write software, the, if your function just for a given input provides some output, it's very easy to write a test for it. You just give it an input and write assertions on the output. However, if your function is doing something else, then just transforming an input to an output has some internal effects. Then you have to bring all your little mojitos and little other you know, softwares and libraries and frameworks just to accommodate the complexity that you brought in. But test, if, you're, if you switch all those effects into values, then immediately that problem disappears. So that's, that's something very appealing if you look at it. Performance. If your software is if you write software which is immutable, functions are there's this concept of referential transparency. You can run things in if run things in run things in parallel, and most likely it will be performing very very well. And lastly, it's very very maintainable. So those are like marketing selling points. This looks great, right? So then, um, I hope like everybody on this particular track because I think this track is sort of like the FP track. Uh, that, at least that's my understanding from the agenda. But let's do a little bit of recap. What's functional programming? When you, when you first introduce to functional programming, you learn a little bit about, about function composition, uh, maybe about caring in your functions. Uh, then you jump into some particular language, like for example, Scala, and uh, there are some little tricks that you use. So for example, I don't know, like, this is just basically a recap. There's a type ID of A, which is essential in A. It doesn't really br give us anything right now, but it, it's just like a building block for more complex stuff. There is a concept of either T. And either T is just a wrapper for an either type. Oh, and by the way, if you, you're not familiar, I'm using the disjunction from, from Scala Z. So if that little thing is weird, I will solve this issue for you once and for all. Think of it. Is it A or B, you know, uh, sorry, I, I had a, I do apologize, I, I think I had like an emoji here. But basically, if you, if you have A or B, it's like, I don't know, maybe A or B. This is an either type, um, it sort of solves the problem that either, either, either type used to have. Uh, it solves right now only a fraction of those, of those problems. But think of it as just an either A or B. And either T just, wraps that either A or B over some F. Uh, reader. Reader is just a wrapper for a function from A to B. You have a function that goes from A to B, and that just wraps over that class reader. There's actually a little bit more uh, complex, and complex version of it. It's closed Cliesley, and Cliesley is just a function that from A to MB. Nothing really fancy. By the way, Cliesley has a different name. You probably heard of it. It's reader T. So reader T and Cliesley are exactly the same thing. And now having that definition, you can finally say that the reader is just a Cliesley of ID. Because as you remember, ID of A is just an A. So those are, you might look at it right now and you might be like, okay, the concept is fairly easy. What, what does it really give me? Like we may understand those little bits, is there's no magic behind it, or there's some function that goes from A to MB and we just wrapped it over a class. What's the value behind it? What's the point, right? And there's a, there's a concept of state, nothing fancy as well. It's one more time a function that goes from some state 
to a tuple of a new state and that A is being produced. And state T is one more time a little bit more complex version of state. Where you have, and by the way, how much time do I have? Because I don't really know. <laughs> Should I be done right now or do I have like 30 minutes? Uh, but anyway, yeah, but that's a serious question. I, I honestly don't know. Um, and, uh, so one more time, state can be just a, a type alias for that state T where our M is an ID. And yeah, and that's, that's fairly easy, right? So now we want to like having all that, somebody tells us, write, now write me, give me an application written in FP. And suddenly, I don't know that it was your, um, how you felt about it, but my experience was that back in the day, I knew those little pieces here and there, but then when I was trying to combine them together, I failed, and I failed miserably. I think majority of tutorials and stuff that are available on the web, that we could consider them together as a guide to functional programming look a little bit like this. You learn about functional programming, you learn about functional composition, carrying, maybe you know what state monad is in reader, and then you learn everything else. And magically have to combine everything together. So this talk is a little bit of filling that gap. I don't know if I will be able to do it. Um, let's say I have 30 minutes, or maybe, I don't know. <laughs> guess. 30 is okay? 20, 20 minutes, that's not good. Um, all right, so we're gonna write a very simple application. I'll start, just, right now we'll start doing my NMN version of this presentation, I'll be just talking faster, so stay with me. So, this is an application that we're gonna write. It's a very simple application. When you run it, uh, it runs on some external service. It's a, it's a weather service where you, give, you, you can call it and it'll give, it will give you a forecast, a weather information for a given city. So I can, for example, provide my city, my town where I live, and it gives me current weather, um, so the temperature is 25 Celsius, and by the way, it also remembers the conversation that I have with this application, so it remembers that the hottest city that I found so far is my city. Then I put Beersheba, and apparently it's a little bit hotter here, and right now I know not only what the, what's the, what's the forecast is for the city, but also we, we sort of see that the, the hottest city is uh, uh, Beersheba as well at this point. Now if I put something which is not a city, something that the application cannot really recognize and send to the server, uh, then we get an error and it, and it exits. But if, uh, if we were giving it the right cities, it would just run forever for eternity. Great, so far so good. The application isn't really that complex, right? It's not really doing that much, but it really or already has a lot of complexity in it. It has to know, has, ha, needs to have ability to read some configuration file, uh, store its own state, have a conversation with an external system that it's by, it's by default effectful. So let's, let's write some FP call. Let's actually try to write it. Before we do it very quickly, this is sort of the third party that we got, that weather service gave us an application, gave us a function that we can call and it will give us a forecast for a given city. So they have a little own domain, like there's a temperature unit, uh, there's a temperature that is just a value and a unit, and, unit, and that unit uh, defaults to Celsius. Forecast is really just hold, giving us a temperature and we'll be asking for a forecast uh, given the city that we provide. So this is the client, this is not FP, this is the third party library that we received from the other, uh, well, company. And now, uh, this is our little domain, this is something that we, we wrote. So we, we need to have a configuration file where we will hold a host and port for that service. Uh, we need to have ability to reason about errors, there's apparently only one error right now which is unknown city, we need to uh, give an information back to the user that the value he provided is not recognizable as a city. And there's also a type which I call request. It's just a map between, for a, for a given city, I know what kind of forecast I've seen already. This is sort of like, think of it as a cache of, of cities that's, that we, we, uh, we run a query uh, so far and we have some values for it. All right, and a bunch of imports in, in order for this thing to work. It's using Scala Z, uh, Scala Z, but it might be as well using cats, and uh, it's using task from Monix. All right, so 
First of all, we need to have an ability to reach host and port. And now we can write this using the FP that we've learned so far. This is basically that information about host and port we can close over, over reader that, that, as you remember, encapsulates a function that reads from the configuration both the host and the port. So far, so good? Hopefully, because I have 18 minutes. Okay, so. And the other thing, we need to also have the ability to communicate with our users. So we need to write something on the console and we need to read something from the console as well. That is closed because those functions like print and get line are effectful, we close them over task. So task takes a given effectful computation and closes over a value that we can return. Uh, shouldn't be really that, that problematic. So there's another, uh, oh, I think I have an emoji here. Yeah, this is the emoji. Uh, um, Anyways, so that's, uh, we need to also have an ability to go from the city name to a city. Uh, the, the internal implementation of this function doesn't really matter because it's sort of straightforward. It's either my town or your town or nothing else. Um, uh, but it doesn't really matter. We, the, the important thing is we return an error or a value. We are most likely interested in a city, but we, from the type signature of the, this method we know, we know it sometimes might not be the city, it sometimes might be an error. And lastly, uh, that little client, we close it over, over task. So we, whenever you, we call for a weather, we don't really immediately evaluate that effect. We close it over task, so it just gives us a recipe of how to call the weather client a, and give us a value, which is a forecast for a given city. Um, there's also ability, there's, we also need a function to give us the hottest city at the given moment. The hottest city that we want to found, find is the city that we've seen so far. So one of the things from functional programming world is this state mona thingy. So we say, oh, it's gonna, we, we're going to return a state of, um, oh, it's missing a type. It should be a state, state of requests and that the value is city temperature. So, oh, sorry, over here, it's supposed to be a request. So the, the map of city to forecast. So here this method only will just go through that list, go through the, all the requests that it's seen so far, um, sorts it for, give, it, give us the hottest one, the hottest city, and we, from that we extract the, uh, the city and the temperature from that forecast. So those are all the little pieces that we just created and when I talk about in FP about, fun about modularity is that each of those functions that we see, we could sort of maybe test, we could do a little bit of reasoning about it, and then we can finally build something more complex on top of that. So, uh, for example, fetch forecast. Um, well, fetch forecast is a function that's supposed to, first of all, check whether for a given city, maybe we've asked for that forecast already, so we'll bring that value from cache, from that state, and if we didn't, then we will just call the, the, uh, the uh, forecast uh, weather client. Well, the type of it cannot really be task because we need to combine both ability to call, do the effectful thing, calling the, the weather client, and also ability to read from the state. So we need something a little bit more complex, and that thing is gonna be state T of task requests. So as you remember, it's just a function that goes from requests to a task of tuple request and that value A. Now, we start to slowly build a little bit more complex and that it manifests itself in the code that we write. And I had to divide it into, into little sub-slides here. But the, basically the idea is pretty simple. For a given request, we check whether already exists a uh, forecast for a given city. And that is being hauled in a value which we call maybe forecast. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Now, having that, we will fold on this value. So kata is just fold. For, for maybe forecast, if, that should be m forecast, not maybe forecast, sorry. Uh, but anyway, anyway, if we got the value, then cool, we're good. We will not do anything uh, more to it. Uh, if, if the value doesn't exist, so if it gave us none, then we will call the weather client which will give us forecast for a given city, and at the very end, we will just map it to a tuple that the state T requires. It, it makes, given that at a limited time, uh, 
I would probably would like to go a little bit more de uh, deeper into the details, but even if it's not clear for people who see it for the first time, you can eventually get there while you look at it. Now, given that forecast at the very end, we just, we just uh, put that forecast into that map as the last step. So we put that into our state, into our cache. We put that value that we just created. If it already was there, nothing effectively will happen. If it didn't exist, now it does. So if anybody else calls this method one more time, they will grab that information from the cache, not necessarily calling the weather client. Now, our last little function is called ask city, and we already reuse functions that we've seen so far. So it gives us a task of string. We ask user what is the next city, and then we read a line, and that line is being returned as a string. So far, so good. So now, now the best part, given that we put this, all that effort in writing those little functions and do a little bit of reasoning, finally, the conclusion, our app. And if you look at it, it's pretty straightforward, right? We, we ask for a city, uh, which is a string. For that string, we, we try to fetch that information about what that city is. We also ask about the host and port so we can call the weather service. We then ask for the forecast for a given city. Finally, we print out forecast for the city is the given temperature. And we, we update, we say what's the current hottest city, and we print that information here. So this little ask, fetch, and judge is sort of ask for the city, check the weather, print out the results. And our final program, it's also straightforward because, as you remember, at the beginning of that program, we were just printing out which service are we using. So we grab that host, that port, we print out that information, and then we take this little function that we've seen redefined here. We take it and we run it forever. It's beautiful, right? The only problem is it doesn't compile. The version that does compile looks like this. I mean, if you used to be Java developers, you're pretty familiar with boilerplate, right? You can sort of like walk through where, where is that little piece of code I'm really, really, really interested in. But that's horrible. And the other, the other program is not, not better. It's basically like that. And it's like you can find your missing pieces. They exist. But that's horrible. Uh, you know, the functional programmer right now at this point seems like this dude, this medieval monk, who just wants to be pure just for the sake of it. Just so it makes him more virtuous, right? And I found this quote really funny because it's in the paper Why Functional Programming Matters. Um, but anyway, if you look at the points, like, like the selling points for FP, they were maintainability, uh, -huh. uh modularity, well, maybe. Testability, there's no way you can test that. Even those little functions, if you think about it, how do you test, you know, your code write, um, works with console. How do you test that? Your code, now our code immediately was calling weather service. How, will we, how do we mock that out? How do we test our program where we provide a sort of like a stop or mocking information for our weather. Let's say I want to say my town, town Wrocław is always 15 degrees because it's almost over is. Um, we cannot really do that. And obey, by the way, performance, uh-uh. The imperative versions of it is going to be an order of magnitude faster. So there you go, half of the community. Now we can go to the other presentation. No, there's hope, there's hope, there's hope. The problem with this solution is that, uh, you probably heard about it, monads do not compose. Because if we think about it, what's the type of, of ask, fetch, and judge? What's the type of it? It's, uh, it's some effect of unit, but what, what the hell is effect? All those little things return different things, and one of them might return a task, the other one might return a state of t of task, some other one might return a either type, they all return different types. And what we did to make this compile was to lift everything so they all align to the same type. And that align, that effect, is that final type that, uh, that everybody is happy with. And we can do that. That's, how we ha that's basically how we can do it. 
we have a state of t, we have reader t, and we have uh, either t. And every type that we've seen so far, we can lift it into that effect type. But it's boilerplate, and it's going to be slow, and no way you can test it. The main application itself is, is fairly easy. That's, that's actually good. Like you, we have that configuration, that empty requests. We create our program, then we run it with those requests and that configuration, and if we get an error back, we print it to the user. If, if everything was a success, we, we're good. But can we do better? So remember this function, right? The problem with this function is it's fairly easy. Nothing really magical ha is happening here. But there's one problem. We already are fixing on the return type. We are already making a decision for the user that the way we go, you're going to provide us a configuration is using reader. We want to have a, we want to write a function where we would like to have ability to get the configuration. That's what we want. But we fix that the way we're going to get the configuration is using reader. And as you later remember, we not in our program, we are not using reader itself. We are using the state T of reader T, and that's the reader T part. But that's not what we provided. The caller of our function, he needs to do the reasoning. He needs to do the heavy lifting. Question is, could we have something like this? Could you write the same functions but just give, give the power to the user. So he can decide what's the F's going to be. We, are just, we just want to say, listen, I will give you a, a string or ports or string or integer, um, but I need to have an access to configuration. But how you will give me that access, that's your call. You decide. Ten minutes. Good. All right. Um, uh, so you decide. Um, so now there's this little type class called applicative ask. So that type class, and maybe just focus on one particular method here, ask. So if you have an instance of that type class for your f, if there exists somewhere in your implicit scope, let's, let's keep it Scala, it will give you the ability, it will give you the E, the environment here, E stands for environment, closed over f. You might be thinking, well, well, what that F is? You don't know. And that's the whole point. You don't need to know. So in this example, where we just were to provide, for example, a string, a representation of host, we might say, there's a function called host, and it will give us an F of string. What that F is, I have absolutely no idea. But one constraint, it needs to I'm missing a slide. Oh, sorry, I did a, um, one thing important here. I did a type alias. So config ask is this applicative ask, but we fill one of the types to our domain, to our config. So that config ask is the applicative ask where that E is already our configuration. Sorry for that. So now we provide one little constraint that can be any F whatsoever, but you need to give me an instance of applicative ask for that F. So if you call it you, the caller are responsible for giving me that particular information. And if you do, then we're good. Then I actually can implement that. Can implement this, this little function because I'll just call the reader and it really gives me what I want. It just takes a read and the reader underneath is just implemented with this, with the ask method. So I have all, right, all I wanted. The difference between the previous implementation is that I'm not focusing on the reader. By the way, reader monad, it has an instance for this type class. You can call those methods up there and fill the F with reader, but also with reader T, and also with any other types, and we will talk about it later <laughs> in seven minutes. Um, but the, the difference is that the caller of your function decides. Same thing applies for a city by name. We used to fig, fix on this disjunction on either city or by name. What we would really like to have is an ability to say, you know what? I will give you a city closed over some F. I don't know what F, 
You tell me, but uh-uh, there's one little constraint. There's another, so you will see a pattern here. But may, okay, may, let's, let's try to work on it. When I have a towns which I know, I know how to provide them a city information, like my town and, uh, and your, your guy's town, then that's fairly easy. I could just use pure from applicative, so I lift that to F and everything works just fine. Now the only problem is, what happens if I want to provide an error? I have an error, unknown city, but I have to give you an F of city. How, I have an error, but I need to give you an F of city. How do I do that? And you will see a, a pattern in this, in this presentation that I will always, whenever I introduce a problem, I will give you an answer. And there's a type class for that. And yes, there's a type class for that. And that is called applicative error. So one more time, we are shifting away the problem. That's the beauty of functional programming. I don't know, somebody else will deal with this. That's, that's what it's actually doing. I need to have the ability to go from my, with this method raise error, I need to, given that I have the error, I want to have an F of A. What's A? I don't know. Who cares? Somebody else will provide me an instance for it. I'm just saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this a constraint on my function. And that's, and one more time, error handler is just applicative error where when we fill one of the holes, we're just saying the error type is going to be our error from our domain. <sighs> okay. Uh, can I have five minutes? Cool. Uh, all right, so now we can call error handler with, I, I blame John for this. I'm not, I was not late. Um, error handler, we will use this rise error method with that unknown city, and that gives us an F of city. How, what, what is this instance? That's an important question. We don't know and we don't care while we're writing this function. Fine, the hottest city, one more time, we used to provide, we used to fix on state monad. We don't need to do that. You know what the answer is? There is a type class for that, exactly. So we want to say hottest city of f, we don't know what f is, there's a type called monad state, which has one of the functions that it has is inspect. So it's telling you, given you have a function that goes from s to a, I will give you an f of a. And that's, that's essentially what do we need? That's our implementation. We, we're constraining our f that it needs to have this monad state. The request state is a monad state of f and requests, and we call inspect. So for given requests, we are finding the hottest city, the hottest uh, city and the temperature. That's what, that's what we provide. And, and this inspect function will close it over f for us. Finally, those little guys, printing and, and reading from the console, the answer would be there's a type class for that, but that there isn't. And if there isn't, let's create one. And that's fairly easy. You just create a trait. You just say console. How do I read stuff from the console? I don't know, and I don't care. Somebody who will call my function will need to provide an instance of this instance, of this type class. So I'm, I'll just, so, so for example, in usage here, you have an ask city. I'm saying, I will give you an f of string. I don't know what f is. What I only know is that f has to be a monad, and f needs to have an instance of console. Somebody will provide me an information, how to read the information from the console, and maybe printing something out to the console as well. Given that, the weather, the weather forecast used to be closed over a task, one more time, there is no type class for that, obviously, in libraries. So we one more time create our little type class here. We close that information. We just give it a city, and it will give us a forecast of f. Obviously, the instance for it at some point will use our client from the third party, but we don't really care at this point. We only care that somebody will know how to fetch that information from the internet. And now, this code will compile. This is all we want to have, and this will, event, this will actually compile. And by the way, this program will compile as well. So what's the difference? The difference is the program ask, uh, fetch, and judge is constrained on some type classes and will give you a f of unit and will do all those effects. But you as a caller have to decide what that f is. 
And um, so our main function, so in our main function, we need to decide what this effect's gonna be. And when we run this program with that effect, we know we need to provide all the constraints for it. So the, for, the constraint for a console is fairly easy. This is close over a task and just printing those elements and reading those elements from the console. That's, that's pretty straightforward. The instance is hopefully uh, like not, not really, really complex. The same goes for weather. We just provide an instance for our weather type class and every, we, we, we provide ability to, when you ask a forecast method for a city, it will give you a task for forecast. And we just, we just closed our, our client over task and that's it. So we have those two constraints. Now the question is, okay, so the effect type, could it be just task? Could it? Well, not really, because uh, if you remember our program, had all those other constraints. Need to reason about state, need to reason about reading the configuration file, and reason about errors. We can still build our slowly, okay, so, so the state we can provide with, with state t, but that's still not enough. We need still to have the reader t to, to do the configuration thing and either t to reason about errors. So we build that stack of monad transformers yet again but all the ugliness is hidden within type classes that you don't even have to write because they are already existing in the libraries themselves. Um, so that's actually about the good thing about running out of time because I didn't have time to prepare benchmarks, but now I can lie. I can actually say, I also have benchmarks for this, but given the time limits, I'm not able to show you guys those benchmarks. No, but I did run those benchmarks in April, so I can actually tell you we get, because I know I have like maybe two minutes and they already want to kill me over there, so just a very quick recap. We now have a program that is testable because writing tests, writing tests for it is fairly easy. You want to you wanna stab your console? Fine. Provide different instance for console. Provide different instance for your weather forecast. You have ability to very, um, in very much detail, point out which part of your unit tests should be supposed to run on the production code, which things are stopped. You might say, oh, that's actually done in, in imperative programming languages with auto-wired things. I, no, 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 it doesn't work. I don't have time to cover that. Just find me on the corridors. I will show you why that is bullcrap. But the important thing is, this will be easily maintainable and testable. The problem is, in terms of performance, it still sucks. Uh, if, you run, if you run this ben against benchmarks, against imperative code, it's still gonna be at least order of magnitude slower, at least. One of the reasons for it is that you have to build this huge stack of transformers. And, and they will, because the way they are being created, when you call flat map on it, it will have to unwrap the other one or call flat map on it, flat map on it, your heap explodes. The JVM has no ability to jit it, and it's like all just very, very slow. Now, the, the cool thing with that, that approach, which is called tagless final, is that you decided on the top, on the type that you're going to use with your function at the very last moment in your main function. If this type is not performing well, you only have to change it in one place. You only have to change it in main. We can, state t gives us an instance for monad state. Reader t gives us an instance for applicative ask. And either t gives us an, uh, an instance for applicative error. But can we do better? Can we provide uh, those instances a little bit, a little bit differently? And, um, yes, we can, and um, I'm not going to cover that because of the time limit, but just, just believe me that using an atomic, atomic comes from, from Monix. It just, whole, it just wraps an atomic reference to a value. We can write an instance of monad state using atomic. So we no longer have to rely on monad state. You can pretty much remove state t. The same thing goes for applicative ask. We don't need actually a monad stack just to give a config. We can provide an instance that just takes configuration here, over here, as an argument, and it will always give it back to the user. So we can provide an instance of applicative ask not using monad transformers, not using client lead reader T or whatever. So we can scratch 
that out. And suddenly, the time that we have is either T of task. And now, if I had time, I will show the benchmarks. Um, now this application is almost as fast as imperative code. The more of those stack, stack, um, monad stacks you remove, the faster your code becomes, and it's an order of magnitude faster between those two versions, order of magnitude. But the nice thing about it is with that approach, you fixed it, fixed this only in one particular place in your main. And everything else just magically works. Now the question would be, this last frontier, could we remove that? Could, we just, could our effect be just task? The problem is, well, you cannot really write an instance of applicative error for for task, in Monix, at least. You could, and I did that. This is the instance of applicative error for task, but only and only when the error itself extends throwable. So when your error in your EDT, uh, ADT is, an, is it throwable, which you don't want to do that, by the way, <laughs> don't, uh, then that, only that moment you could actually write an instance for applicative error and then your effect A would be just task of A. And you know what? It would be twice as fast as the previous version and as fast as the imperative one as well. But the problem is you don't want to write instances like this. You don't want to have your errors extend throwables because at this point, you, what's the point? Like any throwable can be, become an error in your application. I know, I'm done, okay. So anyway, you have two channels of error communication, that sucks. There's a, there's a way to work around this problem, and that's, well, let's skip that. There's a Scala's IO, there's also one for, for Monix. It solves that issue for you. It, the difference is you have the error type part of your, uh, part of your uh, type signature for your IO. Um, so what you should basically do is go to Lucas' presentation that's gonna be happening today. You probably will cover more on that. Uh, uh, have chat with me or, or during the conference, please do. Let's have some beer. And the most important thing, the only way to really, really learn, learn FP is to write FP. So just start writing applications and we'll all just fit in. I'm sorry for taking that time. Well, anyway, my name is Pavel Schulz and thank you very much. Thank you.